Hi, I'm Renee Hobbs, and uh, welcome to, uh, what is the name of this class? Propaganda. And it's the spring semester uh, 2019. I'm here with the amazing students at the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. And it, it's Tuesday, April 2nd. So many of these students are seniors. They're gonna be graduating in just six weeks. They're steaming to the finish line. And now is when all the work comes to be done and now when all the pressure is on. And so let's just take your temperature, right? So five fingers up means you're freaked out, stressed like crazy. One finger up means you're cool as a cucumber. Life is good. And then some fingers in the middle, you know, five being the most stressed, one being not at all stressed. Where are you? Put your fingers up. Ooh, yeah, check that out. We've got a lot of fours, a three and a two. All right, cool. I'm glad nobody's a total maniac with the stress. And, and Harrison, it's great that you are like chill. Um, but the rest of us are working hard. And Pam, you're, you're kind of like happy medium, right? In the middle. Yeah, that's good. I'm a senior too. <laughs> She's a senior too. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Those seniors, they can be stressed. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm going to share my screen with you. And uh, tonight's one of my favorite topics. It's a complicated topic and, uh, and yet a really fun one. Um, I'm sure you noticed that I had a great time picking the image for this week's class. <laughs> <laughs> Just. Yeah, sometimes you really, you really hit it. I mean, last week I thought it was great. I found the trolls and the cat, right? And this week I found the, the gears of the political process sundered by disunity. So our topic tonight is partisan propaganda. Uh, you guys got to um, get like a, a light introduction to this book, Network Propaganda by... Um, a guy who's pretty legendary, just if you ever wanted to like name drop, since you're in New England, right? You name drop this guy, Yohai Bankler. And like, you get hired instantly, okay? This guy is a professor at Harvard Law School and he's kind of like one of the leading legal minds on the internet and society. In fact, he's a fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. So uh, this book is a pretty like scholarly dense book and you guys got a little light introduction to it, but I can see right away that you jumped right into making sense of it. And um, so the focus question for this week was, how is propaganda amplified by partisan media outlets? I noticed on the path right, uh, I noticed on the path right that you guys have already started to find examples of um, partisan propaganda uh, for this, uh, uh, find examples of partisan propaganda. This isn't due till Friday. Um, but you have already started to find some very interesting examples of partisan propaganda and post them to your wall. So if you haven't looked at this wall recently, it's getting every day um, more interesting to see the different um, kinds of examples that you have called out. Um, and I did want to just comment on how I'm very, very pleased with the um, strategies that you've been using for doing the um, uh, learning activities of this class, uh, you know, because this is a class where we don't have an hour and a half to like sit around and, you know, bullshit twice a week. It's actually just engaging in these learning activities and then reflecting on them. But um, I finally got around to look at the uh, slides that you created and I made some comments on them. So if you go back, you can see that, uh, over here in the margins, I don't know if you can actually see that. I'm not sure if I can get make you see the margins. But over in the margins, I made some comments on uh, propaganda examples that I thought were really great, right? So some of these examples really stood out. Um, so um, just was really pleased with um, the work that you're doing 
uh, here. It seems like you're finding ideas that you can wrap your head around and really um, run with them. Um, okay, so I thought one thing that would be kind of cool, th this topic is so big. You could probably do a whole class, like a whole 14 week class just on this topic of partisanship, right? It, it could be a journalism class, right? Uh, so it's really kind of crazy to do it just in one week. But I want to call your attention to this cool definition. Hint, hint, hint. This definition probably will find a way to make itself to the final exam. So understanding networked partisan propaganda is kind of important, I think, for the second half of the semester. And it's defined as having these qualities, a potent mix of verifiable facts, a familiar repeated falsehoods, paranoid logic, a consistent political orientation, and within a mutually reinforcing network of like-minded sites. Well, I started digging around in some aspects of this definition, and I found some really interesting stuff. And I thought we could look at one interesting thing. He's, he's, this interesting, it's a video, this interesting video is actually produced by one of my favorite YouTubers, Veritasium. His real name is Derek Muller, and he's really a science YouTuber. But he helped me understand that familiar repeated falsehoods is actually a well-established research <laughs> tradition. And so now give me a thumbs up if you can see this YouTube video on the screen. Okay. He explains the science behind the idea of repeated familiar falsehoods. And as we watch, we're probably not gonna watch this whole video, we're just gonna watch a little bit of it. As we watch this video, I want you to think about what ideas jump out at you as we watch. So let's take a look. And, and isn't he adorable too? Like he's smart and he's a PhD and he's a great YouTuber and he's adorable. So let's watch. Has shown that if you're repeatedly research has shown that if you're repeatedly exposed to the phrase the body temperature of a chicken, that's right, the body temperature of a chicken, even if no useful information is given about the body temperature of a chicken, you are more likely to judge as true this statement: the body temperature of a chicken is 34 degrees Celsius. It's not, by the way, it's actually closer to 41. But this finding highlights an important aspect of our psychology that plays a huge role in how we see the world. The things we're exposed to repeatedly feel more true. Now, the way this seems to work is through a mechanism called cognitive ease. Cognitive ease is a measure of how hard your brain is working, from easy, like when you're scrolling through Facebook, to hard, like if you're trying to multiply 14 times 37 in your head. Things that are true generally elicit cognitive ease, like fire is hot, earth revolves around the sun, dogs have four legs, and so on. Not only do these things feel true, they also feel familiar, effortless, and they feel good. All of these are outcomes of cognitive ease. Now, the trouble arises because cognitive ease can be artificially created in other ways. One way is just by repeating the stimulus. In a classic experiment at two Michigan universities, experimenters took out ads in the school newspapers. Each ad consisted only of one of these nonsense words. They were printed with different frequencies. One word appeared in the paper only once, while others appeared two, five, ten, or twenty-five times. The word frequencies were reversed at the other university. At the end of the experiment, researchers sent out questionnaires asking people to rate the meaning of each of these nonsense words on a scale from it means something good to it means something bad. And the findings were clear. The more frequently the word had appeared in the newspaper, the more people felt it meant something good. So with enough repetition, even a nonsense word comes to feel familiar. It triggers cognitive ease and overall fear. Experiments have shown that this also works when showing English speakers Chinese characters or even random shapes. And the finding is even more general than that. Songs are judged more favorably after you've listened to them a bunch of times than on the first listening. And participants looking at yearbook photos judge the people in the photos as more likable after seeing that photo more times. 
Which that brings up the question, what are the Kardashians famous for? Depending on who you ask, you may find that they're famous for nothing or just famous for being famous, but really they are famous for exactly the same reason anyone is famous. For their names and seeing their faces over and over again. Now, they are familiar, you have experience with them in the past, and therefore they are processed with cognitive ease, which also feels good. This is the core of the advertising industry. The idea that repeated often enough, even brown carbonated sugar water seems really appealing. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, I think we are, I think we can stop now because now probably you can uh, make some connections between um, the topic of partisanship and the topic of cognitive ease. Anybody want to take a stab at it? What are the connections between the topic of cognitive ease? and the topic of partisanship. I guess the idea of a feedback loop would apply to both. Yeah, explain, what do you mean by that? Um, kind of like when the same information um, just gets like reproduced within the media and it just perpetuates the same kind of like ideals or mindsets. Got it. Thanks for sharing. Other perspectives on how does this topic of cognitive ease that we just learned about from Derek Muller, how does it relate to the topic of partisanship, which we've been, and partisan propaganda that we've been studying this week? Um, like, if, if you say the same thing over and over again, like I think we watched like a Fox video on it. If, if you continually like just say it and say it and say it, people will start to believe it, even if it's like insane. Um, I think an example of this is like, I, I think the Republicans are like trying to push this idea of like after birth abortions that like no one's like, it's not real, but like they're making it a thing and they just keep saying it as a talking point. Right. Yeah. Right. That's a good, that's a great example. Boy, in the last two weeks, I have seen six or seven, maybe, maybe more uh, different stories on that topic. And you're right. Uh, rep repeated often enough. Even a blatant falsehood like that can come to seem true. Other perspectives on this issue of how have you encountered repeated familiar falsehoods? Uh, not, to, not to like bash Republicans at all, but another similar one that I think is the same as what Anthony just said is like um, stricter gun laws. Like they keep saying they're just trying to strip people of their Second Amendment guns, but in reality, they just want it to be a little harder to get guns and for guns to only be in the hands of people they should be in. So I don't know. I always, I always see that whenever I, I have an uncle who's really into guns and he always, he, he hates any liberal because they, he thinks that they just want to take his guns away. But nobody really is saying that they just don't want guns to be in psychopaths hands, you know? Right. Right. So that, that idea that uh, in some ways there's a whole bunch of familiar falsehoods associated with the, um, pro-gun uh, industry. Uh, right now, we've been seeing a lot from Dana Lois. She's the uh, famous spokesperson for the National Rifle Association. Uh, and her, um, her skill is uh, repeating <laughs> inaccurate information about gun control uh, uh, to make people paranoid, which actually brings me to the second topic. I felt like in some ways the big challenge for this week is wrapping around the, wrapping your head around the idea of partisanship and then networked partisan propaganda. Those are two kind of different things, according to Yohai Benkler and his researchers. Because he says network partisan propaganda has to have the potent mix of verifiable facts, the familiar repeated falsehoods, and paranoid logic. And I felt like you know, what I know about paranoia would fit in a thimble. I don't know about paranoia very much. And so I started trying to look around for a really cool video or something about paranoia. But what I found <laughs> was Hamza how even cooler, a set of paranoid gifts. Okay? So I'm going to break you into a small group. And I want you to scroll through the paranoid gifts. There's a lot of them. 
So I want you to just scroll through the paranoid gifts and I want you to talk about one with your partner, okay? We're gonna try to see if we can explain how we understand paranoia and how, we, how these gifts explain different aspects of paranoia. We're only gonna do this for about three minutes. Give me a thumbs up if you know what we're doing. You're gonna click on that link, you're gonna scroll through the paranoid links, and with your partner, you're gonna to try to see if you can explain paranoia in your own words. Okay, here's the breakout rooms. You are breaking out into uh, just three rooms. There we go, look for, the, look for the link now. Talk it over with your partner. Okay. So if you're if you're still watching, you're with me and we're taking a look at this crazy, crazy set of gifts. So you're thinking about what the heck does paranoia have to do I'm looking for one that kind of resonates with, um, hmm. I've never actually really been paranoid. I've known people who are, and I would say this one kind of works for me, this sweating, right? Seems like paranoid people do have a lot of irrational emotional involvement so i'm going to give that one a little i'm going to oh i have to oh to give it a heart i have to sign up i don't really want to do that <laughs> um but i like that one a lot mm. let's see now strangely this uh, this little animation one also works for me because I, when I think of people who are paranoid, I think about uh, people are really distrustful of others and really suspicious and fearful of other people's behavior. They're really, um, they feel um, in danger almost psychologically, right? So that, that one kind of resonates with me. Let's see. Uh, this one I think doesn't really have anything to do with paranoia. I need you to text me every 30 seconds saying that everything's gonna be okay. That's a different kind of psychological problem. I think that's more associated with neediness and dependency. <laughs> so I don't think that's quite, I mean, maybe they go together a little bit, but I think that's a different phenomenon altogether. So not all of these capture the psychology of paranoia, which is, uh, oh, hmm, the Simpsons one looks pretty good. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes, there you go. The mutual suspicion distrust, right? That definitely captures an aspect of paranoia. Definitely captures an aspect of paranoia. Yeah. Okay. So let's see here. I think that that pretty much seemed to uh, work here. So I'm going to close all the rooms. Okay, we're coming back. We're not all together back, but we're coming back. Um, to try to see how, how or whether the gifts affected our understanding of paranoia. So can you put the definition or can you interpret paranoia in your own words and uh, explain how you understand it? And what does it have to do with networked partisan propaganda? And which of those gifts captured the idea of paranoia the best? 
we we looked at the gif of Nick Miller from um, New Girl, and he was kind of like looking over his sho- shoulder and like uh, paranoia, like especially with like network artisanship, like makes you feel like not secure and makes you feel like you have to like double check all the facts you're reading. Kind of like what he was doing in the gift. So. Mwah! Mwah! Wonderful. Who else? Um, Jessica and I just kind of said like it's, it's a hysterical fear of something that like hasn't happened yet but could potentially happen. And I, I think we, we like the gif of like the dog just like staring around like a crazy person with you guys. Right? So the dog, the crazy dog seemed to capture the spirit of uh, paranoia from your point of view. Thanks for sharing. Other perspectives on this issue of paranoia? Did you actually make It's kind of interesting because now that I'm looking at that girl in like black and white who's like looking around frantically, she doesn't really look like she's scared. She looks like she's like looking for something, which sometimes paranoia is more like confirmation bias where you're looking for something that um you know it's like you're gonna see the information that you're looking for versus like what's actually true good point so you're recognizing not all of these gifts actually capture with precision the concept of paranoia that one you're right bleeds over into something else perhaps um but um Paranoia was identified as a psychological concept uh, back in the 1920s and the field of psychiatry was uh, taking off. And it was basically uh, found to be um, an eccentric or an odd way of thinking rooted in this idea that uh, somebody's out to get you, right? And that somebody is aiming to do you harm and that... um, People make paranoid logic is when people string together unrelated facts to create a a, a a story that explains how, you know, the postman is uh, planting a bomb in their mailbox, right? Or um, the, the neighbor who hates you put a tick on your dog to hurt the dog intentionally right? That kind of crazy, crazy thinking. Um, And in some ways, networked partisan propaganda does try to put together facts to make a coherent worldview rooted in this idea of us versus them, right? And we learned eight or nine weeks ago that us versus them was a seminal feature of propaganda, right? Along with activate strong emotions, appeal to audience needs and values, simplify ideas, and then attack opponents. So paranoid logic is a really interesting version of the classic us versus them and simplify ideas aspect of um, aspect of um, of what we've been talking about. So, okay, so that's kind of cool. Now, let's see. Ah, it's time now, before we do this kind of interesting activity with the media bias chart, I wanted to make sure I have time to see, to talk with you about your third leap, which is due on Friday, May 3rd. Uh, Last week, in last week's class, I asked you to look over this assignment, but I didn't really talk about it too much. And so the focus question for LEAP 3 is, what have you learned about propaganda this semester, and how will you use what you have learned in the future? So in this LEAP 3, you engage in reflection and metacognition to synthesize your learning. You're really thinking about your own thinking right, as you have moved through the course this semester. Um, So in in LEAP 3, you almost have to do some personal detective work to identify what you thought were the most important ideas from the course and consider how they are relevant to your life moving forward. So you have to reflect on how you learned this semester, 
and what you learned, right? Um, and this is probably going to involve reviewing some of the activities that you completed, noticing patterns in your own learning, and students are going to not likely to respond to this the same way because we each are experiencing this course in a unique way um, because of the way you have choice. So there are two components of this project. I want you to make a listicle of the top 10 insights. This is in the form of a blog entry where you identify the top 10 insights on learning about propaganda. Um, in this listicle, be sure you offer a catchy heading for each of the 10 insights, along with a descriptive paragraph with some more information and uh, details. Here you can explain ideas using a combination of hyperlinks and author date citation to refer to learning activities or resources from the course readings and videos. And you probably need to reflect and make connections to your own life, reflecting on your past, present, and future. It, this is an academic uh, blog post, so it's expected to be about uh, 2,500 words, and you can use images as appropriate to make your blog entry more attractive and read readable. And then, once you've got your listicle, I'm gonna ask you to create a Spark video where you highlight the three most important, troubling, or interesting ideas and use a combination of language, image, or music to express key ideas. This video should not be longer than four minutes. Now, thumbs up if you've made a Spark video before. Yeah, okay, so Anthony and Pam, can you tell uh, the rest of the class about like, what is a Spark video? Dan, go ahead. Um, on the last class, we just used it for introductions. Okay, you used it for introductions? <laughs> All right. It was just like, tell us who you are. It was like online, you just press the link. I think it was like hyperlinked or something, camera or whatever on the computer. Ah, you might be thinking of Flipgrid. Yeah, oh. maybe maybe not. Um, so let's, let's go take a look at the introduction to Spark video. Uh, so I'm going to just share my screen with you now. So I clicked on the link here. Uh, it takes me to Spark Video. Spark Video is a very simple video production tool. Watch how easy it is. Get started now. So I can, I can title my Spark Video here. I can pick a story template. Let's see now. I've got a bunch of choices, right? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, well, you know, this probably personal growth one is probably a good one. Um, what I'm given is a template that allows me to uh, choose assets like images, video, and text. Can you guys see this video now? Thumbs up if you can. Good show. You can use video. You can add images. You can type in text. You can or reorder your slides. Ooh, that's cool. You can select different themes to make it pretty. You can resize your video. Make it square or widescreen. You can record a narration. This will be really important to you. And you can choose a music track or you can upload your own music track. And you can preview your video. And you can publish it and download it too. All right? Yeah. Okay, so um, Spark Video is the easiest video production tool that exists. Even a very young person can use it, um, but it actually allows you to create quite a sophisticated work as well. So you're going to have a lot of fun with your listicle and your Spark video. And as you work, you're going to pay attention to the criteria for evaluation. Not all of you guys were attentive to this in 
uh, previous work. So I want to make sure that you, to do well on this assignment, you should read the criteria for evaluation to make sure you have uh, fulfilled the expectations for the assignment. Um, as I said, this video, this uh, video and the listicle is due on Friday, May 3rd. And I bet you have questions about this assignment because you have just one month to complete it. What questions do you have? Um, do you have to use Adobe Spark? Yes. Okay. Yes, even though you might be good at iMovie or WeVideo or some other tool. What if you have another Adobe product? Say again? Oh, you, you have another, another you have Creative Cloud or something, right? Yeah. Yes. Nope, gotta use Spark. Okay. What other questions do you have? Okay, so you're feeling like this is actually gonna be kind of, if, unlike a boring 25 page paper that you have to write, uh, this is actually going to be a fun activity. Uh, I think maybe what we wanna do is, for benefits of the students who are watching this recording, can anybody explain to me what's a listicle? You guys have to create a listicle, but I didn't explain what a listicle was, but I think you know. What's a listicle? Okay, so since nobody is answering, I'm gonna ask you guys to go to Google right now and type in the word listicle. I'll give you 90 seconds and I'll give a prize for the best answer. Go! piece of writing or other content presented wholly or partly in form of a list. Anybody find anything else? A short form of writing that uses a list as its thematic structure, but is fleshed out with sufficient copy to be published. Okay, anybody find anything else? Um, There's examples of listicles like all over BuzzFeed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, BuzzFeed invented the listicle. Very good. Extra credit for doing a historical, pointing out historically, BuzzFeed invented the listicle. Very nice. There's all kinds of examples all over BuzzFeed. Bu BuzzFeed. Good. What else did you learn about listicles? Listicles usually feature clickbaity type headlines, right? Because listicles are a way to get attention. So in a way, you guys, let me just try to underline this. You have to use some propaganda techniques, sort of, in your Leap 3 assignment, right? Okay, just saying, right? Keep that in mind. Okay, uh, if you guys have any questions about Leap 3, the best way to uh, ask those questions is to ping me on the Twitter. All right, now it's 7.33, perfect timing. Um, I wanted to show you this really interesting, I started thinking about how to explain the difference between partisanship and networked partisan propaganda. Because, those terms kind of blur together, and I feel like it's important to make that distinction. I'm taking you to this really interesting website called All Sides. All Sides is a website that offers um, different perspectives, different partisan perspectives on the news and current events of the day. So today's feature, Joe Biden accused of inappropriate behavior toward women, right? And we can see three different stories from the left, from the right, and from the left, right? So Sean Hannity says, 
Don't expect creepy Joe Biden's friends in the media to hold him to the Kavanaugh standard. Welcome to Hannity. Right? All right. Just breaking as we uh, speak tonight. Well, we call him creepy and crazy Uncle Joe Biden for a reason. Well, now he's facing a second accusation of inappropriate touching. It's been a rough week for the Democratic Party, and it's only Monday. Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez embarrassing herself yet again. Senator Elizabeth Warren running out of other people's money and wannabe columnist and communist. Oh, Bernie Sanders, he can't answer a simple question about his own policies. And you just heard the breaking news. Creepy, crazy Uncle Joe Biden. He's facing a serious backlash for... You guessed it, being creepy. We begin tonight with our Hannity watch on the radical 2020 extreme democratic socialist. Well, he hasn't yet formally entered the race, but already, well, creepy Uncle Joe is facing two separate allegations. Okay, got it. Well, that's pretty clear, right? Creepy, creepy Uncle creepy. Joe. <laughs> All right, let's, um, let's take a look at this one. From the left, the Washington Post. Joe Biden needs to cut it out. So does the mob. So does the mob. This is an op-ed. See how it says opinion up here at the top? So this is an op-ed. Um, and it definitely looks like he is doing some touching of the wife of the defense secretary, Ashton Carter. Um, and Mm, he calls it the trait of a tactile politician, Biden being Biden. But a quick Google search of creepy Uncle Joe finds an avalanche of video proof that his space invading overtures are not always received with delight. Right? And then it uh, describes some of the characteristics, um, the some of the characteristics of his actual behavior right? What's really interesting about all sides is the way in which it um, offers you different points of view on uh, various topics. And um, it has a whole bunch of different topics. It's, you can search along a bunch of different ways. And it even has a characteristic of describing what partisanship means to them, right? So um, notice how it identifies the um, strong liberal, the soft liberal, the conservative, the right, and the kind of radical right, right? So it offers a view of pa partisanship I love this activity. It's like a quiz. Rate your own bias, right? And see how you compare to others. So, um, and you can uh, understand how um, this group of journalists, um, oh no, C means center. Ah, I got that wrong. C means center. That makes sense. S left, lean left, center, right, lean right. So they're organizing news media by um, the partisanship. I think I prefer the word partisanship over the word bias. But here's my question to you. Is there any difference between the two words? Partisanship and bias? Olivia. When you say, when you say bias, are you like, is it strictly like a political bias? That's a great question. What answer that question? What what do you mean by that political bias? I mean, there's all types of biases, but like in relation to partisanship, I feel like a political bias would like fit fit best within the same realm because like partisanship is like supporting a certain party, and like so in that way, they're kind of the same. But like there's other types of biases that don't aren't similar to partisanship. Oh, that's very, very nice. It's a really good point to point out that there are many types of bias. And so maybe partisanship only works as equivalent to bias if we say political bias. That's cool. Other perceptions about the words partisanship and the words bias, are they is that is that the same thing or how are they different? 
What are the nuances of meaning associated with those words for you? I kind of uh, put the bias thing more uh, it, towards the conservative or liberal um, than partisan and partisanship more being Democrat or, or Republican. I think of partisanship as somebody who is a strong follower or adherent to the party. Um, and I mean, I know dem Democrats who um, aren't necessarily, don't necessarily are biased in a certain way, but they, but they vote, re vote Democrat. Or, and I think the same is true for some Republicans I know. Right. right. So, so then, so you distinguish between having a, an identity, uh, a partisan identity with a political party from having a liberal or conservative bias. Yes. I think that's an interesting distinction. Other perspectives, what the words partisanship and bias, are they equivalent or political bias, I guess, as Olivia points out, rightly so. Are they equivalent or are they different? Do they have different meanings for you? Or are they really the same? Um, like, I kind of think they're the same. Like, especially like where we are, where like everything's like so like polarized. Um, Cause I, I don't know, like, I just know, like when I see like the new Democrats in the house, I see way more brown people on that side. And that just makes me more comfortable than the old white dudes on the other side. And just like seeing that image, uh, even if the policy doesn't even show, or like statistically, like just seeing that visual makes me more inclined to lean left. Right. And then harbor onto the issues that they're telling me to care about. Right. And maybe the word bias has kind of a negative sense, whereas uh, the New Democrats, right, and with their diversity, the, yes, there's a certain part level of partisan focus there. Um, but that's because they're trying to address issues of income inequality, right? They're trying to address issues of health care for all. So it, it might be uh, that partisan is a more neutral term um for a, a, a topic that's pretty close to bias but now i want to get to this question of whether or not these charts are a good idea so i go back to the page here and i invite you to take a look at this one uh give me a thumbs up if you can actually see that media bias chart i'm going to see if i can make it a little bit bigger there there it is so from the point of view of a news consumer, what are the pros and cons of a media bias chart like this? You can see that the bias chart has on the horizontal axis, liberal utter garbage, hyper-partisan liberal, skews liberal but still reputable, mainstream, minimal partisan bias, skews conservative but still reputable, hyper-partisan conservative expressly promotes views, utter conservative utter garbage conspiracy theories. And on the vertical axis, you can see it starts at the top with original fact reporting, fact reporting, complex analysis, analysis, opinion or fair persuasion, Selective or incomplete story or unfair persuasion. Propaganda contains misleading facts, contains inaccurate or fabricated info. And you can see how different news organizations are placed on the chart. From your point of view, what are the advantages? From the point of view of a media consumer, what are the advantages and disadvantages of a media bias chart like this? Well, you know what, where like the facts are and like what is true and what is someone's opinion. Okay. So, you know, like what to trust and what to even like repeat or share with other people. Good point. So you might be more comfortable sharing content if it were up there at the top of the chart where it's fact-based reporting, right? 
um, or a complex analysis, and you might feel less comfortable sharing stuff that is completely fabricated down at the bottom of the chart. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of a chart like this from your point of view as a media consumer? I think that some of the big advantages would just be being able to really tell who's giving you facts based off who's getting reporting for views, which is, I think, the biggest thing that we see in the mainstream is things that are just attached to views. Like, we'll see a video because it's been shared so many times and it has 20 million views, but then it's from Fox News Daily or it's from something that's very far left or very far right. So I think that being able to tell actually giving you facts is pretty unprecedented. And there's really nothing else you can base it off besides facts. And then you can kind of make your own analysis from there. Good point. So instead of basing your decision of quality based on the number of views, this gives you another, an alternative way to judge quality. That's an advantage. Other advantages or disadvantages to a chart like this? I can think of like, while it could maybe lead to you having like a more balanced media consumption that um, like stuff that's deemed as like a neutral source may not really like necessarily be unbiased um, or like really be reasonable information because just because something is like extreme doesn't mean that um, it's not true, I guess. Right. right. Very good. Um, yeah, so Jessica, that's such a great point. So in a way, um, uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? So maybe just because it's in this column doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, true or good, just like it, stuff that is further outside that center is completely garbage, right? Uh, other perspectives on the advantages and disadvantages of a chart like this from the point of view of the media consumer, that's people like us. I noticed a 2017 um, publication date on that. Mm -hmm. And I was just left wondering how many news sources have popped up since then that aren't on the chart. Aha! So that's a great observation. Um, in fact, she does update this chart, but that brings us to this other question. So, uh, Pam, you're right that the fact that it's an old chart, uh, or an older chart, 2017, means it's probably incomplete. Like anything, any media message, right? This chart represents the point of Vanessa Otero, the woman who created it right? It's her judgment about where these news organizations fall. So sometimes when we see a chart like this, we forget to recognize that it's a media message too, right? And created by somebody with bias. Created somebody with bias. <laughs> so we, we might just take that chart for granted and say, oh yeah, that's, uh, you know, you can't, you can't trust the daily costs or uh, CNN is a little left of uh, center, but this is Vanessa Otero's interpretation of the, uh, of the um, partisanship in the news source. And now let's ask that related question, which is what are the advantages and disadvantages of a chart like this from the point of view of the media industry? From the point of view of the media industry, can you think of any advantages or disadvantages of a chart like this from the point of view of a news media producer? Are they happy about this? Um, are they happy about this chart? Do they think this is a great idea? Or what do they think might, what might they think would be the advantages and disadvantages of a chart like this? They probably hate it. Explain why. Um, because they want to appear unbiased and that their opinion is like in the center. It doesn't lean any way. Yeah. So putting this chart would be like, okay, well, I'm just going to get all these centrist opinions because these are real facts. Yeah. So they might hate the being labeled like we all do. 
Great point. What other advantages and disadvantages might a chart like this have from the point of view of the news media organization? Well, it could be good for them too, because then people who do view the same way, like have the same views as them, could be more inclined to like watch their news and like read their news instead of the other people. That is an excellent point of view. In a way, this, this chart takes the brand and associates it with a partisan worldview. And you might never have heard of the nation before, but you see it on the chart where it is and you go, ah, oh, I might want to read that, right? Because it associates the brand, the name of the publication, with a certain partisan worldview. Great observation. Any other advantages or disadvantages that you could see from the point of view of the news media maker? Are they happy about it like, or not? I feel like a negative would be that, like, associating um, a news party with a certain political view is, like, not good. Like, the mixing of politics and media. Okay. So, t say more about that. So, like, if it's like labeling like a news station as like democratic views or Republican views. It's like just gonna like lead to the questioning of their reliability as an information source. And that's not how it's supposed to be. Right. So some of these organizations um, are going to resist being positioned in relation to partisanship and other of these organizations are going to embrace that. Right? So uh, we're still in a kind of transition period, having kind of, um, well, our country started with partisan journalism being normal, that during the time when the founders of the Constitution were writing, that's what journalism was. It was highly opinionated, it was a, paid for by political parties, and it was definitely not always accurate. And then we moved into a period of time, historically objective journalism, right? Where we understood journalists to be a neutral and unbiased and uh, to remove political opinion from their work. And now we're entering a new phase of partisanship, right? But each, each version of that approach to journalism is, is contested by journalists within the field, right? And New York Times journalists might be very unhappy to see how they're placed here or someone from the Atlantic or um, some, uh, somewhere else. What I think is really uh, intriguing is that a, a chart like this could become a mm, shortcut for doing the actual close reading of an article to figure out its bias, right? And I feel like uh, I wouldn't want a chart like this to be a substitute for critical thinking. Right, so that would be my personal concern. Right, aware awareness that it could be really helpful for me getting familiar with different kinds of publications that I am not familiar with. Right, and especially because one of the strategies I try to use to address being a citizen in this hyperpartisan age is I try to read widely. I try to watch across a wide range of publications, so this can introduce me to publications that I'm not so familiar with. But I wouldn't ever want a chart like this to be a substitute for critical thinking. And that's, of course, what its danger might be. So, okay, so we've kind of thought about partisanship in, in, um, in a bunch of interesting ways. And now it's time, I think, um, for us to conclude. Let me just see if I can, I can, ah, oh, what's, where is my, where is my, my computer is acting, oh, there we go, aha, okay. Um, so, a preview activities for next week. Oh yeah, 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 this is gonna be fun. Uh, so next week is a really cool topic. Um, let me just go to the path right, and now, mm, ah, what happened here? So I've, uh, okay, I'm gonna just click out of that all together. I'm gonna open up a new window. Um, 
My new computer has some little quirks that I'm still getting used to and it's driving me crazy. It's just too powerful for my own good. Okay, so um, let's take a look at what's on tr track for Pathrite for next week because next week's topic is, oh man, it's dark. We're getting dark, we're getting darker, we're getting darker. Our next topic is terrorism as propaganda. Give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen here as I'm going through the path right. Okay, um, so the focus question for next week is, why is terrorism called propaganda of the deed, right? And uh, you have a bunch of, really interesting uh, options, a lot of options. So remember that uh, you only need 20 points for each week, but I've given you a lot of options. This week we're going to, you have a lot of choices of topics. You can choose to learn about ISIS terror propaganda, anti-Muslim propaganda, or neo-Nazi terror propaganda. You must read and annotate at least one of these articles. We're using a annotation tool called Hypothesis to engage in collaborative digital annotation. You know, I'm really trying to introduce you to all of these digital tools that people are using in the workplace. It works like this. First, you click here to join the COM416 group. You'll need to sign up to participate in our group. And then you click here to access the article. What you're gonna see is, uh, if you take a look here, you're gonna see over here in the far right side, this little thing pulls out. It's called a annotation skin. And you can see here that I've already started annotating this article, as has have some other people. And um, I'm commenting on the uh, website in this kind of skin-like way. I can see um, everybody's annotations here in this little tool. So that's what you're gonna be looking for, this little hypothesis annotation tool. What I want you to do is at least three things as you're reading this article. Um, make a connection between the video clip that is up at the top of the page there and the article. Um, summarize a passage to express its meaning in your own words. Define an interesting word that you come across. Highlight one passage that's meaningful to you or comment on a passage that's meaningful to you or wonder and ask question about a passage or reply to the comment of another student. So if you're interested in ISIS propaganda, this might be the place to start, but you might be interested in anti-Muslim terror propaganda uh, we're going to look at an article. You might want to read this article called Spreading the Mosque Shooting Video is a Crime in New Zealand. And you'll do the same thing. Click here to join the group, then access the article there. So you're commenting and reading. You might be interested in this absolutely fascinating article on neo-Nazi terror propaganda, right, from the uh, crazy alt-right. Uh, and it's called The Base. It's absolutely fascinating. You might be interested in reading that article. But I know you're all going to enjoy um, watching our film for next week called Suffragette. We're going to be looking at feminist terror propaganda, right? Uh, why don't we just watch the first uh, minute or two of this video? I want you to watch the whole film this week. You can watch it on HBO or you can watch it on YouTube. Let's take a look. Women should not exercise judgment in political affairs. If we allow women to vote, it will mean the loss of social structure. <laughs> you work at the laundry? Part-time from when I was seven, full-time from when I was twelve. We meet Mondays and Thursdays if you're interested. You a suffragette, Mrs. Lilly. I consider myself more of a soldier. As Mrs. Pankhurst says, it's deeds, not words, that will get us a vote. Okay, this is based on a true story about the British feminists who used violent political action 
to uh, get uh, the right to vote. Um, so you can view it on HBO uh, beginning April 8th, or you can view it on YouTube for $3.99. After viewing, respond to three of the questions of your choice on the Flipgrid discussion. Here, are, here they are, right? Uh, this, I think, is going to be an absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, so that's really the highlight of the week. I would like you to take a look at some of the Leap to work created by Comforce 16 students and tweet some warm feedback. You can see that I put a link here to all of the really cool Leap 2 projects that you guys have created. Look how cool they are. Um, so uh, I'm grading away now and I want you guys to uh, look at one example and uh, tweet some uh, positive feedback to uh, one of your peers. And then I'll meet you back here on Tuesday, April 9th at 7 p.m. So we've reached the end of our um, our class this week. I am so grateful to um, the two uh, Jessicas, the amazing Olivia, the amazing Pam, Harrison, and Anthony. Thank you for joining me tonight for tonight's class. If you're watching this uh, recording, uh, take a look at the note that I'm putting in the um, um, in, on the class uh, page to see what your special assignment is for this week. So I'll look forward to seeing you guys next Tuesday. We're going to be talking about terrorism, but terrorism in all its complexity uh, as a form of propaganda that can be used for good or evil. So have fun with it and I'll see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>